welcome to the first edition of the BizLogic Metaverse podcast. Today here with me, my co-host Fabio, maybe hey. you introduce yourself first. Hey. Hi Joe, uh, I'm Fabio, I'm one of the business development leads at BizLogic and today I'm here with Joe to talk a little bit about what we're doing at BizLogic and why the metaverse is a thing for us and we also think obviously for, for a couple other industries, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I should have probably gone first. My name is Johannes. Um, I'm the other business development guy for um, for BizLogic, and um, yeah, I've, I, I'm on board since about four months now. Yeah, one I think of the, since October, right? One of the latest additions to the team. Yeah, I mean, I've known you guys for ages, but um, it was always uh, you know something that I was really interested in. And probably something. one of the most uh, uh, like interesting onboardings you had. We should, we should talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll keep that for a later episode. That was definitely a funny, funny, uh, funny chapter. But um, yeah, maybe um, we just um, start off by um, telling you guys a little bit something about our platform and then just uh, maybe go into some questions, go back and forth. And Yeah, and first and foremost, why, why are we doing this? Like, what's yeah. the reason for this Actually, podcast? Yeah, that's, that's probably a good topic. So, um, we, I mean, let's let's be honest. We are we, we do business development for um, you know for for a metaverse platform. So um, you know we we're looking to to expand our business, to bring more people on board, um, to show more people how how easy it is and uh, what the potential is of getting into the metaverse. Because I, I personally, you know. I feel like there are a lot of uh, misconceptions out there still today about um, the platform and uh, certainly in the media there's a lot of mixed messages floating around. Absolutely right, yeah, the, the metaverse buzzword bingo we call yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so so we basically we know that a lot of people out there think that you need like a like a VR headset to get into the metaverse, and a lot of the you know big uh, tech players are still uh, trying to push that narrative. Understandably, right? Understandably, I, I know I understand why they're doing it, right? And this um, is where we come come from as well. I mean, with BizLogic, we've been doing uh, VR development for quite some time. I, I think our team started in. 2013 or 2014 so before it was cool let's yeah. say like this yeah, yeah, yeah and um i mean we've we've always been uh, on the on the cusp of saying hey vr is like a super interesting thing to being to to be getting immersed into these virtual worlds is something that can't be replaced by a 2d screen but something that we figured out in the past few months years is that it's not necessarily a requirement to enter the metaverse um at least that's our take on it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's something that's actually um, you know a big part of of my my just my my, my daily conversations that I have with people. Um, yeah, me too. I'm, I was a little surprised when I started off. I mean, I, I already knew a lot about the metaverse. You know, I came from a VR background, but um, I I wasn't prepared just how misinformed people are out there. Yeah, that's true. Um, Perhaps you can tell a little bit about what we uh, what you were doing before. And yeah, sure. What led you here? So um, I, um, I I used to work for for a company that uh, produced 360 degree video, mm -hmm. and it's really I, I like I don't think there's a there's a historical like uh, um, you know precedence for 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 a situation like that yeah, where true. you just had so many you know tech new tech topics coming into our you know sphere of thinking at the same time that were also um, so closely connected, right? So in, in in the past, you had like one new development and then people sort of had time to get used to that. And now it's like 360, VR, <laughs> AR, uh, you know, crypto, blockchain. And and, and it's, it's so rapid that I understand that. And I mean, even for me, I work in this, yeah. I've been working in this industry for like- We're in the bubble for 10 years, right? Yeah, yeah for 10 years. Well, with you a bit longer than for me, for me, it's like six or seven years, but still I, I breathe that stuff. My entire social media feeds are just full of it. Yeah. And still I'm at a point where, you know, I'm not a developer, let's be honest. Um, I, I, I work with that stuff on a daily basis and, and still there's topics that I, you know, that I need to freshen up on and stay on sort of on the, on the top of, uh, you know, what the latest developments are and stuff. So, um, that's a huge part of my, of my daily business is that I have to explain to people, just forget about blockchain, forget about crypto, <laughs> oh, forget yeah. about all Those that topics, stuff. Yeah. You don't need that. We're here with an opportunity for you to, to see, and, and let's also say at this point, 
we're not the only ones doing this, right? <clears throat> There's a lot of other people out there that are, um, you know, producing metaverse content that is very good and very accessible and all that. And I'm sure if they were sitting here and maybe one day we can, you know, invite some people over, so, yeah. they would be saying the same thing. Yeah. And um, but the main thing, what, what I'm what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to tell people is that it's it's as easy as falling off a log. You know, if you if you have a website and and and, and any kind of business or anything, um, there are metaverse applications that make sense for you today, right? And it doesn't matter if your audience has a VR headset at home. Yeah, I think so too. And also for us, I I believe so. How did our platform emerge? First of all, which I think one of the biggest factors for it was the the beginning of the COVID crisis, right? So, um, like to to make a little intro, so we co-own this space here in Hamburg, which is called VRHQ, and one big part of it is like a huge VR arcade and event space that we were like um, renting out for several businesses who wanted to like get to know the technology and also do something cooler than just renting like a sports hall and doing like their uh, annual meetings in there, but like have something more like with a little bit more like fun factor, right? So um, when COVID hit us, we sat there and I think for like the whole 2020 year, we had 60 or 70 events scheduled that all got canceled, but also we had like the technology background from all our VR developments that we were doing in the past. So um, I think it was the most ob obvious thing to do for us to uh, think of how can we combine these two skill sets and how can we create this opportunity and also this replacement, which at that point in time it was, for all these businesses to be able to still host their events, still be able to meet, even though it's only virtually, but have something a little bit more interactive and more interesting than, yeah, just going back to a video call, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and I should probably mention that the you know I I like I said in the beginning I worked with these guys before. Yeah. Um, I was also part of that whole cosmos here with the showroom downstairs and everything. We saw each other on a regular basis, and yeah, when the pandemic hit, um, you know, things just shut down, and it was weird because on the one hand, I always felt like oh we're working with this technology that is that is you know, perfectly suitable for the situation, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, how do we how do we take the skill set and make something out of it? And, um, and, and of course, you had that bottleneck of, you know, the the, the tech out there. Um, and, and, and then at the same time, there was the chip crisis, and, and yep. suddenly the production for the headsets went down and all that. So it was a, it was a wild time. Yeah. And also most applications that we were producing back then, even though they were like VR applications, right? We had to deploy them locally. So there were like immersive training that yeah. we uh, did for, for like several industries where you think of like a two, three hour long training where people are in the VR goggles and they go through the whole process, but still they were deployed locally. They had like 10 headsets or 10 systems and then they had 60 employees and they had to go through it. So still there was no real application for it during COVID, even though you should think, hey, we're talking about VR. Why isn't this possible now? So I think I think one big uh, limiting factor was the accessibility of the headsets. First for of sure, all, for sure. and also when we were um, going further and thinking of like larger scale events, this was no option anymore because even though like some of our big uh, some of our clients are super big and like you should think they sh they should be able to afford like buying several hundred headsets and then ship them around. This was not, not really a use case, not really a use case because then chip shortage came along. The headsets weren't produced anymore. Here in Germany, especially we had a, a like a big uh, topic with um, Meta Quests not being uh, sold because of some regulatory things, right? So there were all these factors that brought us to, um, to think of how can we introduce people to this technology outside of this VR technology bubble Somehow, Fun, right? Funny anecdote about that. So I had, obviously I, I talked to a lot of clients that, that, you know, are not in that sort of VR metaverse sphere yet. And, and we have to sort of introduce them and all that. But the ones that were at the time, I'd say almost half of them asked me on a regular basis whether, you know, I could also get them some headsets, right? Because they were having <laughs> yeah, too, yeah. yeah, it was so bizarre. Um, so we weren't just selling content; we were also, uh, um, you know, um, you know, a reseller of hardware in that sense. But anyway, yeah, it was it was wild, and and obviously it, uh, um, yeah, the metaverse just was the next step that made sense for everybody, right? It was there. Uh, like I said, we had the skill set. 
<coughs> and uh, and we also had some ideas that we had uh, um, you know gathered through not only our experience in in creating you know shared digital worlds, but also in in hosting this event space here. So um, and and you know the the um, uh, the product that we're using now, um, I think, um, shows that it's really a brainchild out yeah. of that yeah. out of that conundrum. When you hear the word metaverse, what what, what would be like your personal definition or what are the things that you um that you think of first when you hear this um i get that i got asked that a lot obviously but it's, it's a good question um because i it, it used to be actually i used to tell people that it's you know think of the think of the internet mm -hmm. but instead of a 2d web page you have a 3d space that you can w w yeah. w move around in right and and that is what it is in essence but i think that that actually uh, uh, um, you know, especially for people who aren't familiar with the topic at all yet, it, it makes things even harder, I find sometimes. Yeah, okay. So what I've told people lately, and I, and I think that that is for me now sort of something where, where uh, for me it's easier to define it in that sense, and that is just a shared three-dimensional digital experience. Mm -hmm. In other words, by shared I mean <clears throat> it, it's the, the whole metaverse uh, experience sort of goes down the toilet if it's just you, yeah, right? Yeah, you have a nice environment if it's done right. And, and if there's some gamification aspects, it's also, it can be funny and everything. But the real uh, benefit of it and the real sort of uh, unique selling point is that sort of shared experience, right? And the kids already know that, Fortnite, yeah. Roblox, yeah. and so on and so forth. Uh, um, those are all uh, platforms that are already being used. But I mean, the people that I talk to on a daily basis are not 13 years old. Yeah. So a lot of them have to be, you know, taken by the hand and, and shown, right? And so, in terms of conceptualization, would you think, or would you say there's rather like one metaverse or is what we're doing, is that a metaverse or like there's several metaverses being combined? Or I, I think this is something that's, gotten wrong a lot outside uh, like outside of our bubble so um do you think you could like summarize this a little bit so i i i heard a uh, podcast re podcast <coughs> recently by um the author of snow crash which is neil you know, stevenson neil stevenson yeah, okay. which is which is like the the book that that founded it all and he said something that i thought was very valuable in that sense and that is that there is a metaverse mm -hmm. right and and uh, um and people who talk about metaverses may or may not fully understand uh, uh, what is actually going on. So I, I, I sometimes even you know call it meta worlds if you're talking about like individual environments. Yeah, I've been hearing the word microverse a lot, which I think describes what we're doing pretty well because in the end of the yeah. day, we're like creating these mini like sustained yeah, sustained that's, that's worlds for, for our would, customers, right? That's another one that could work, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think all of them combined at a certain point in time, and I think this is going to be sometime in the future and also not only two, three years, probably five, ten years from now, like when all the standards are there for like being able to um to for example share items from platform to platform i think this is the state this is going to be the stage where we can call it a metaverse like we're calling it the internet right now i think the only thing or not the only thing like it's a big part missing right now are like the protocols or uh, the, the standardization of of assets and how you can like transfer stuff from one platform to to another do you do you ever do like online betting no, unfortunately no. not. Unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a there's a there's different ways on how you can bet on sports, for example. Okay. Right. So uh, uh, and there's a there's a game in or there's a one form is called that I like is is called the over under. Right. So mm -hmm. you have to if if you if you bet on I don't know the the hundred meter sprint. Right. You you take the world record, which is like nine point five eight right now, mm -hmm. and you bet on the over or the under. Right, mm -hmm. so you have like a 50-50 okay. chance, right? So uh, if you had to pick the over/under for how much time we need until, uh, you know, VR headsets are a common sight in workplaces, what would be? Would your over/under be ten years over or under? Like for real mass adoption, probably over. For something sustainable, where you could say people make business with it. But not probably not everyone has it. Probably under. Okay. And how long do you think before? Uh, like, what's the over/under for um, 
um, you know, big telecommunications providers offering some kind of AR device in the rollout with their newest mobile phone model, would you say it's eight years over or under? Oh, definitely under. Really? Yeah. Okay. Why, why do you think it's under? I mean, <laughs> okay, probably <laughs> this is too optimistic, but I mean, we've been in the VR bubble for a long time now, and I know what you want to get to, but um, I think the development of AR and VR have somehow always been parallel. Nevertheless, AR has always been a couple of years behind. So I think with these mixed reality headsets coming up, with this, like, for me, like, the real beginning of these, this kind of AR um, devices, which are still not sleek enough as like, like you would wear them in your uh, everyday life outside. But I think for, for most uh, work-related um, use cases, they're going to be useful enough three, four years from now. Okay, interesting. I, I would also say that, right? I sometimes have to sort of hold myself back because I, I just see the the. But obviously, this year's Apple's uh, AR headset is going to be released like yeah. the last six years. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe for the viewers, like what I'm trying to get at is that right now we're at this sort of this sort of yeah. Um, I mean, metaverse has been a topic for like a year and a half, two years now, right? It was a topic before as well, but like where something where like where you see it on the news, right? Because that's, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's really the moment where you have to, you know, consider it something that the, the broader audience is, yeah. is thinking, talking, considering, whatever. So, uh, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a topic for about two years now. But um, um, the, the, through, the, through the whole, like, mixed rhetoric, I don't want to say false news, but at the end of the day, that's what it is. If somebody tells me, oh, you need a headset to go into the metaverse, that's false news. What, what do you think, where, where are these, like, misconceptions coming from? <sighs> Honestly, I, I think it's, it's um, well, I think it's a simple <laughs> answer to that, is that you have, uh, um, you know, big tech players like Meta, for example, who are producing a headset uh, that they want to, um, you know, to dominate that market with. I, I would probably do the same thing if, if I were them, um, especially because through what happened, uh, I think it was a year and a half ago, right? Mm -hmm. when, when, when Apple decided to uh, uh, basically lock Facebook out of their, their data yeah. in the sense that they weren't allowed to, to mine data from Apple users anymore. Um, that's what Facebook does. Uh, sorry, that's what Meta does, right? So uh, um, they had to start thinking, especially in North America, right? Here in Europe, uh, um, obviously Apple is one of the big players, but it's compared to North America, it's, it's nothing, right? They have a much bigger yeah. market share up there. So for, for them, all of a sudden, it was like, okay, we're being locked out of this huge data source. So you think that was one of their triggers to like Absolutely. go all in? in Absolutely. The okay. I think it was... Yeah, the biggest trigger, right? Because so if, if you're if you're uh, um, you know meta and you're thinking, okay, I'm I'm no longer able to collect the data the way I used to from this huge, and I don't know what the exact percentage is, but you know maybe half, maybe more. Mm -hmm. I think it's more in the U.S. It's more uh, of the of the total uh, mobile market. Yeah. Uh, um, and you're suddenly locked out of that space. So, okay, where do I go from here? Do I just accept the fact that I am that I'm in a reduced yeah. role? Or do I look into the future? I look at my own portfolio. I look into the future and I say, okay, we've got this VR thing, right? Which has huge potential, but we haven't been pushing it as much as we did before. So cut our losses, right? With what happened in the mobile market. Obviously, st that's still their business. That's still what they're yeah. making most of their money with. But how do I, how, maybe I can literally take this entire industry by the horns and, and make it my own. Yeah. Right, and and I think that's one of the biggest become synonymous for it, right? Yeah, right. exactly, and change my name to yeah. literally be unrecognizable. You know, we from have like a really good analogy that we I I at least always uh, tell people, which is just like it's Facebook renaming themselves to Meta is like the T Mobile renaming, like if T Mobile would have renamed themselves in the early two thousands to great the internet. Yeah, great analogy. <laughs> like, great analogy. Um, yeah, I think that would be the same thing. And, and I understand why, right? But I have to say, you know, as critical as we all are of that whole development, it's, it's a pretty courageous move, right? It's, I mean, you're really going all in on, on something. Yeah. Um, because uh, if it fails, you, um, you know, you're, you're just, just sitting on your, your, your data business 
which is still uh, you know big, but you know how it is in today's age. Everything has to go up and up and up and up with yep. continuous growth and so on. And um, you, you, you can't do that if, if, if that big part of the business just breaks away. Yeah, and um, to be honest, I think on the hardware side, like they're doing amazing work. Um, but I also get why people are so disappointed with with what's like um, concerning what, what their software development in terms of their metaverse deployment is. But I think people have to understand that this is just like a tiny part of what they're doing. I think they're right now focusing a lot on developing the hardware, getting it into uh, as many hands as possible. And the metaverse application itself, which in right now I think is Horizon Worlds, right? Um, it's just like a super tiny part of what they're doing. And there are a lot of other companies like ours, just as an example, who are trying to do the same thing in kind of another way uh, or not. Some some also try to do it the I same think, way they do. I think we should mention though that, um, I think it was last week, 10 days ago, something, Facebook announced that they are actually now, they've decided to, to, to open up the, yeah. their metaverse to, to allow for browser-based yeah. usage and, and mobile. And so so they're figuring, figuring it out as well. Yeah. I just, I think that they're, I mean, they have, you know, <laughs> the, some of the brightest minds in the, mar in the business yeah. out there, right? So they must, have been ha they must have been having the same discussion that we've been having for like over a year now. Yes. This just this doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, yeah, the, the I, reports we were reading, right? Like, did you try to deploy the headsets to their own employees and more than 60%, I think it was? Yeah weren't even like touching the box or like un yeah. unboxing the that, that's the another yeah, that's, that's another, another topic yeah. right but but i i think that uh, um that particular news right uh, um for, for me and for my you know mot motivation and, and 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 you know needs in my in my daily life hasn't gone out quick enough right no nope. it's and and still to this day you know i i uh i'm i'm reading a lot of analysis that are they're still going on about how you need a headset to go into the metaverse and so on and so forth um maybe maybe let's let's talk a little bit about um like uh um, browser-based metaverse uh -huh. and and how it works and um you know what what some of the easiest quickest uh, uh, applications are that we see out there. Yeah, cool. I, I think there are two general routes that one could take to deploy a metaverse in the web. One of them being the like technology wise, right? One of them being WebGL. Basically, this is a technology that allows you to render 3D graphics in the browser locally on your local device, which has some huge benefits. Obviously, the, the accessibility is super high. Um, you um, you don't have to have any extra hardware to to be able to to run the whole thing. You don't need a head, you don't require a headset, but you can still connect it to a headset because these WebGL applications sometimes have uh, have the possibility to just toggle VR on. And if you have like a headset connected, you can jump in uh, straight. But um, they're also limiting in certain certain regards because you're always going to be limited by the. Um, by the potential computing power of your of your actual hardware, right? So, um, if you have like an old business laptop, with, for example, in our in our business cases, uh, going to be like this eighty percent of the time. Um, they probably not going to have a good experience in terms of fidelity of the environments. How many avatars can be there uh, in there as, uh, at the same time? Don't, don't they have um, um, like it's 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 easy to bring three D models on board, right? In in WebGL, it's I mean it depends. There are some platforms uh, everything's built on like three JS um, or Babylon JS. I think there's all, and there there are a couple more platforms that basically allow you to to have a little editor like a web based editor to kind of start building these worlds and. Um, they all come with like a specific standardizations of, in terms of what kind of 3D models you're able to to throw in. But um, in the end of the day, you if you access one of those uh, those websites, which in the end of the day they are right, your PC device, whatever you're using, is going to download all the content into a cache folder, which also makes the platform a little bit more insecure, because if you would be like a really, uh, really well uh, um, guilt or trained hacker, you could like probably try and access these 3D models in the cache folder if you find it, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's this complete other route of um, basically rendering um, the whole image 
remotely in the cloud. And this is the route we're taking. It's called, like mostly the, the technology is called pixel streaming. You can also refer to it as cloud streaming. But um, mainly what we're doing, I don't know if you ever used like a remote desktop connection. It's this, the, the, It's not the same technology, but it's super similar in terms of analogy, right? So you go into a browser, you can go into the uh, onto a domain, you can um, which we can basically freely link, and then um, a system in the background somewhere in the cloud, like in the best case, as close as possible to your IP, is going to be uh, booted with the whole application running on it. And the only thing your PC is computing or is required to have is like a stable internet connection. And then you get basically get like an interactive uh, live stream of the, of the whole virtual environment, which is something that NVIDIA and uh, we're trying to do for the gaming use case with NVIDIA Shield. But they, the, there the use case was not so stable because like you obviously lose a little bit of latency and um, for for the gaming use case specifically, if you think of like first person shooter game, like every millisecond is relevant. But you don't you don't think we're going to be revisiting that <coughs> once five at a certain point? Yeah, once five G is sort of pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. But yeah, this is basically the other route. What this allows you to do is to outsource all the computing power, also standardize all the outsourced computing power, which is I think an amazing thing because if you think of it like a developer, um. And now you think of like you want to deploy a game, right? And you release it on a Steam platform. You have to think of so many different devices you have to make this thing work on, um, which is like a huge like overload on on additional work that that like is put onto you, right? Mm. If you now think of releasing something in a in a, via a pixel streamed kind of network, you have like one target CPU, one target GPU, you can specify it perfectly and you basically have one final requirement of what your application has to run on, right? Mm. And um, this makes the whole development process a lot faster and also allows you to render way more beautiful environments, have way more people inside these virtual worlds as avatars because basically you can specify the CPU to be like a top tier CPU and like compute a lot of information which is required if you want to have a lot of avatars in these virtual environments at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, but um, so let's let's get a bit more into the use cases. Right? Yeah, it makes so, more sense. Um, right now you have uh, people trying to sort of dominate their area of the metaverse and and we we have to differentiate between these islands and interconnected uh, uh you know environments yeah exactly because this what i forgot to mention is they're obviously not only browser-based metaverse services but there's like these huge platforms that are install based like roblox right yeah 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 so you have uh, um 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 you know micro uh, verses as yeah. you, you called it <laughs> uh, um that have uh you know their own currencies their own look and feel uh, um their own uh, logins uh, their own avatar uh, generators and all that and their user base obviously. and their user base yeah. and then you have other sort of uh, and I, I, they're often referred to as islands right because yeah. they are sort of uh, uh um, you know independent spaces with their own environment and everything and then you have that sort of you know the sort of more traditional vision of where the metaverse is going to go which is an interconnected space where you you know and and obviously uh you already have uh services uh, like ready player me that are uh sort of playing into that uh definition of it with uh um you know features that go across uh, yeah platforms. interoperability is the big exactly, keyword exactly yeah. exactly right and some of the the the, the early uh, use cases obviously were sort of um you know events and uh, networking and, um, you know, what we did in the beginning where you had uh, big trade fair fairs yeah. that were canceled due to, during the pandemic and then uh, saw this opportunity as potential to moving into virtual spaces. Yeah, and people had to find replacements. And also because most, most users of these replacement platforms, which in the beginning were a lot of video conferencing platforms, were kind of disappointment of the, yeah, of, of the fact that, those were not really interactive. Those were mostly like this frontal keynote speaker character kind of thing. You didn't have like the networking and the community feeling that you would uh, have on a physical event. And I think this is where um, 
we tried to hook in yeah. because we said, hey, we have the potential here from from the whole gaming industry who is basically doing nothing else for the past 20 years than bringing people together online and multiplayer experiences. Why can't we do this for businesses? I th and I think it goes even beyond that in, in a sense that you have this whole industry, right? And, and a lot of times, uh, um, you know, the metaverse and, and all these uh, um, tech topics are compared to, uh, you know, industries and, and tech developments that we know from the past, yeah. like mobile phones and social media and so on and so forth. So um, our clients confront us and anyone who, that works in the metaverse with the same set of metrics to analyze whether or not whatever they're doing is successful, right? So one of the things that, that I noticed very, very uh, in, in the beginning right away when I started really getting into the topic is, and, and I should say that I have a background in online marketing, yeah. right? And, and some of the big uh, metrics that are always being, being taken in these, in these platforms are, what is the user engagement? Engagement time. What yeah. is the bounce rate on yeah. your website? Uh, um, how many interactions take place? Where do users move around on your website? Now, all these things are perfectly applicable to um, you know, browser-based, web -based based, web-based, web, web -based yeah. and VR, obviously, also. Yeah. But, but so the, the nice thing there, we immediately uh, realized that in some of these areas, uh, the metaverse is much more performant than, than normal uh, online marketing. Yeah, right? it's incredible. So if we think of public metaverse deployments that we do, the engagement time on a like, usual website, right? And we're talking about average. So you're talking about probably 50% of people are dropping off in the first two seconds is uh, around 20 to 25 minutes, which for a website is incredible. Yeah. If we're talking about internal deployed events or applications, it's even higher. It goes to towards like the one hour, 20, one hour, 30 mark. Yeah. So if you take all the, the use cases that sort of dominated the industry in the beginning, meaning networking events, yeah. uh, uh, you know, trade fairs, showrooms, and those things, and you apply that to a, a um, you know, a metaverse campus model. In other mm -hmm. words, a, a, um, a meta world that is always online, that is always accessible, where um, you as an organization, company, enterprise, whatever, get to tell your story, whether it's with gamification or just information or any kind of entertainment networking features. All these things, right, can be, uh, um, you know, basically used and populated by the same storytellers that have existed in the gaming and online marketing space because a lot of or those even things, the physical space right? <clears throat> or the physical space yeah. yeah right we have a lot of tools that have or most of our user interface is based on you know what are the perks of having an in-person yeah. <laughs> uh, event or an in-person meeting how can you use that apply it to a user interface in the metaverse and 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 what how can we go beyond that right i mean there's no yeah. limits we can do whatever our fantasy uh, or creativity uh, limits us to and i'm pretty sure there are things that we can't replicate in the metaverse of course especially if it's a, like a 2d based browser based thing but there are also so many things that you can do in the metaverse that you can't do in a physical world which are incredible if you uh, if we think of how many um, like formats we can deploy in a platform and we're talking about like interactive uh, workshop formats for example we um, we were discussing an um, interesting format with one of our uh, potential clients past week uh, in the past week which was about how can we get um, people to get to know each other in the virtual space a simple feature that we could deploy here is to have like something um, like a networking or a speed dating experience. So we're even thinking of deploying this room where all the avatars are like a silhouette when they when they come into the room and only after talking to another person for over, I don't know, let's say 10 seconds, they start like their avatar starts to appear as well as their name and their business, like their, we have virtual business cards on our platform to to like exchange contacts and, and so. And so, these are things that uh, I think in the metaverse are like super easily gamified and implemented in a user interface. If you would think of organizing something like this in the physical world, um, and we've also been like working in the event space, I know that from you as well. Yeah. It's like like so much work to do. In our platform, it would be like just clicking a button in the admin menu and like applying the the format, right? So. Yeah, and, and to, to go back to the to the use case, uh, um, you know, some of the examples, um, we 
in essence, if you, if you, if I think back at that that t- my time in online marketing, right, it was it was always tricky to to find a way to to do marketing, and at the same time do your storytelling yeah right so because anytime you want <laughs> to yeah. Do, yeah any it's it's two things that are sort of opposed right if, if you want to do storytelling and you brand it too much people are not engaged right so here we now have a platform where you can actually do both things at the same time and still we see that the user engagement is is you know exponentially higher than on on you know any other website out there yeah and you can either do this on like existing platforms like you were mentioning something like roblox where we've seen some some interesting use cases from from the fashion industry for example and we are going to talk about that in more depth next time in the next episode with some super interesting guests um or you can just deploy it on your own website which i think is um if you think of how do you get people into your event, the one approach would probably be the pull approach where you have like all the community like the community on the platform and you try to pull them into your um into your environment right whereas the other one is you can do real push marketing here you can like just yeah. run a google ad and like generate traffic on your website and yeah, like yeah. basically generate traffic in into your microverse and maybe that's actually a good uh, a moment to mention the the ease of the onboarding and the login process yeah. right so in, in a sense it's it's like you're putting a website out there right you have a url that you send to whoever person you want to access the site or you could just post it on your website and just yeah. say this is the access yeah. to my meta world you push that button you go on there you you create an account one time or you could even leave it open right it has its i mean own it depends on what your use case is a company yeah. or is whoever deploys this is right because um either you you some some of our clients use it for internal purposes so they have it in installed in their it infrastructure so that people with like their company email addresses can log in they have their avatar there all the time and uh, they can reuse it for any kinds of use cases sometimes they, they they use it for internal workshops they use it for pr tours for uh presentations like just three weeks back we had like a huge town hall meeting from one big skincare uh uh, company here uh, here in Germany with I think 1,400 people inside the space which uh, which like brings us probably to the next topic which is sustainability they told us that in the past they were doing all of this physically and I think with uh, with the event done our, on our platform they saved around 160 tons of C- carbon dioxide uh, yeah carbon yeah I, I mean that's that's if you consider what was it like a, was this this year where that scandal came out that those big like carbon trading platforms yeah. where big corporations are trying to offset their carbon footprint and it turns out it was all bogus right yeah so um that doesn't mean that that discussion is no longer relevant no. right and uh and and if we can you know offer uh, a a a um a way to to offset that in another way uh like eradicating you know large scale uh, um you know air traffic going to events um like we did uh, for 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 you know for ces where there were big companies that needed a quick solution on how to virtualize yes. uh, their entire presence there then um you know that that example that you just gave is just one of many that yeah. we've been achieving which I, I think the ces example is also really interesting because it shows the transition that we were doing as like a platform provider together with our clients using the platform because in the beginning it was all about replaced uh, replacing uh these events that not take place anymore and they, w- w- which was like our clients initial use case as well in this case it was for ces and png who basically deployed their whole life lab inside our platform and i think in the first year we had like four or five thousand people like running as uh, through the platform as avatars which if you think of it it's crazy right yeah. but nowadays they've emerged to using the platform as an always on solution which i think is what we've been experiencing with most of our clients yeah yeah so to sort of you know sum things up a little bit um you have ease of access right it's as easy as sending out a url you have ease of maintenance right we've got a whole list of templates that people can use right now right and it doesn't matter whether you have a a creative team that can set up your own environment or you know or whether you can just say go to us and say look uh I, I have this this idea. I want to try this metaverse thing. 
I maybe don't have time or don't want to spend as much money or, you know, don't have the manpower to set one of these things up, you just pick and pop one of our templates and you're good to go. Right. That's the easiest way. Yeah, to exactly. It. And then I think what we're exper or what also we with our strategy are trying to um, to go towards is like to to include as many people as possible in the creative process because we're only a limited number of people in our team. And yeah, yeah. obviously we started as a full service provider for these kind of metaverse experiences, which has been going great because it gave us like all the experiences in our team and also gave us the creative freedom to build these incredible environments and these incredible storytelling experiences and gamification experiences. But also we know that there's like a bunch of people out there who are like, super good in creating 3D assets, creating 3D environments, but probably don't have the skill sets to create like the, the fundamentals to run a platform like this. And um, and why should they? And why should they? Yeah. You, you yeah. focus on your business, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll do the creative part for exactly, you yeah. or take whatever <laughs> pointers you have and, you know, build it into something. You know, it, it's so the, the, the browser based uh, um, metaverse uh, solution is something I think where you can just, you know, you can pick and pop finished products um, that will allow you to get your foot in that door, that will allow you to, you know, create your own storytelling space and that will allow you to just get that user engagement, get that community building tool um, that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So if we if we try to summarize uh, why we are sitting here why why would you say we we started to do this podcast because it's a friday afternoon and we no, i'm just joking <laughs> i'm just joking um uh yeah because uh, honestly there's so has much it to do time. with frustration <laughs> it, obviously yeah it has something to do with frustration of course because um you know think about okay we're we're we talk to people people talk to us there must be a huge vector of people who, you know, are interested in it, go out on the web. And, you know, we were talking about bounce rates. Bounce rates have something to do with low uh, attention spans that we have these days, right? It's, it's part of our society. We live in a mobile world where people have like the, the attention span of, of a hummingbird. <laughs> and we'd probably be chopping up this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Second yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, what I'm trying to get at is that, okay, I don't see enough people, enough channels out there that make it clear how easy it is to do this, right? And 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 I mean, when I whenever when I want to, you know, uh, learn a bit more about the latest out there, I always have to dig through mountains of crap. Sorry, before I get to to something that is that is uh, you know based in in reality and represents what the what the current state of the industry is. Yeah, true. And and that is sad, and it's counterproductive, and it's 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 keeping people out of you know what they could be doing in this area. And I think especially, and this is what we've been planning a lot, is to also include industries who probably didn't have to do anything with the technology, yeah, in the first place, right? So I mean, for the next uh, for the next episode, as we were mentioning, we're um, we're talking to some people from the fashion scene who are obviously already pretty much into the technology if you look at platforms like Roblox or or, or other use cases but uh, we've we are also be we also be covering some some other industries who probably didn't have to do anything with uh, with uh, VR or metaverse per se so for example one of our uh, potential clients or uh, for the future is from the insurance sector where I think that there's so many opportunities to like um, uh, for for the specific use case on, for example, like showcasing your insurance products in the metaverse, where you can like like show the policies and what is supposed to happen. So and, and you talk, can talk about an industry that yeah. that needs to find a way to do yeah, storytelling, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, to, to so this this was the 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 you know the metaverse about the metaverse uh, uh, episode, and then we're gonna dive deeper into some of the other topics and some of the other use cases. Um, and so. for some other episodes, we're also planning to introduce our team a little bit to get some of our uh, team members uh, here with us and probably also tell, <coughs> sorry, tell a little bit about their Have some of that like, uh, creative process. I um, think could be super interesting to talk to some of our designers, for example, yeah, yeah. who are like um, there all day creating these amazing virtual worlds for, for our use cases and probably don't get as much credit as they deserve because... 
they just get deployed for a specific client and then they're there and nobody sees them beside the client who uses that all day, right? Yeah, yeah. So go to uh, www.bizlogic.de. <laughs> go check it out. Dot um, com, man. Dot com. Or dot com. Um, no, we've got we've got a um, um, a long list of topics. Not just uh, you know what Fabio mentioned, but also um, we have a whole roadmap of new developments coming out soon um, that uh, we'll be talking about. I'm sure. Yeah, inclu including a whole rebranding. <laughs> so yeah. basically, to to give you a little story at the end here. So the this whole platform came out of such a market demand and necessity that we don't even have a product name for it yet. So this is still something to come in the next few weeks. That's and how quick things happen. Yeah, that's how quick yeah. things happen. So basically, we've been deploying this platform for over three years now, and it still has no name yet. Um, but still, I mean, um, we we took the opportunity to develop it as the best we could and include as many features as we could and this has been the main priority for us and i think now has come the time for us to spread the word spread yeah. what we're doing trying to get as many people on board as possible also our team is growing it's crazy so also if you're probably interested in uh working with us um got a couple of openings we have a couple of openings which you can also find on the website from like team assistants to like designers, audio people, programmers, really everything you can think of. Um, yeah. And we have this really beautiful spot, which we probably should also make a tour of at some point in one of the future episodes. Yeah, we got some cleaning to do before that. <laughs> True. All right. So on that note, see you next time. Take care. Thanks so much for listening. Cheers. Thanks, everybody.